The Nintendo Switch is finally here and brings with it a wealth of new ways to play games. The Switch can be played at home on your TV for a more traditional console experience, or picked up and played outside in front of a sunrise. Handheld gaming isn't anything new of course, especially for Nintendo. The idea of the Switch is the culmination of decades of Nintendo's innovations in the video games and technology industries. Let's look back on the house that a plumber built to see how he got here. Nintendo has a rich history of handheld and home consoles with both running concurrently since the company entered the electronics market in the 1980s. In fact, Nintendo's first game device released in Japan in 1980 and was called the Game & Watch. 59 different game versions would be made and the devices themselves also featured a clock and alarm. In 1983 Nintendo released its first home console, the Nintendo Entertainment System or NES. Like a phoenix rising from its ashes, the NES was the platform that revitalized the video game industry after its crash that same year. The NES set the standard for how a video game systems should operate and Nintendo was adamant that games coming out for the system would maintain high quality experiences. With Nintendo's increasing dominance in people's living rooms, they sought to be part of people's train rides, flights and hangouts with the Game Boy in 1989. This system was revolutionary for its ability to have console quality games on the go and even play multiplayer with the link cable. Like the NES, the Game Boy set the standard for handheld gaming and Nintendo has used swappable cartridges for theirs ever since. In 1990, the world of technology was moving rapidly, and Nintendo kept up with the release of its Super Nintendo Entertainment System. While 16-bit gaming was already in full swing thanks to bitter rival Sega with the Mega Drive, the SNES came out swinging with consistent gaming hits. The 16-bit era proved the most vicious of all of video games history between both Sega and Nintendo. The Mega Drive was the cool system for 90s kids with skateboards and backwards caps, but Nintendo maintained their Games for Everyone philosophy with iconic, non-threatening characters and franchises. In 1995, one of Nintendo's biggest missteps made a quiet release and death, the Virtual Boy. It was meant to be the first sort of virtual reality home console featuring red and black graphics and migraines. Seriously. While the Virtual Boy crashed and burned harder than the games industry in 83, Nintendo didn't kill stereoscopic 3D gaming off entirely, they merely put it on the back burner. By the middle of the decade, video games were getting bigger and more complex thanks to a new dimension, but Nintendo found a way to make it all possible with its next cartridge-based system the Nintendo 64 in 1996. This marked the first home console capable of 64-bit 3D games, unlike the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn which were still 32-bit. Unfortunately, due to the high costs of game cartridges for developers and consumers, this allowed the PlayStation to take the lead and establish discs as the new standard for console games. But that didn't stop Nintendo from delivering on quality with fantastic games that still stand the test of time. After almost 10 years of life, it was time for the Game Boy to finally leave the world of yellow and black. In 1998 we received the Game Boy Color, a smaller, more powerful and less battery hungry gaming system that exploded alongside the worldwide conquer of Pokemon. For the turn of the new millennium we received not one, but two new systems almost immediately. In early 2001 Nintendo created the Game Boy Advance, a 32-bit handheld system that would later get a clamshell makeover in just a couple of years in the Game Boy Advance SP, and the GameCube, Nintendo's first disc-based console that would go on to be the last system the company would invest in the graphical horsepower race. Both the GBA and the GameCube were significant in that the two systems complemented each other. Franchises like Zelda, Metroid and Pokemon all benefited from cross-system connections that did things like unlock new mechanics, functions and even entire games. The GameCube also marked Nintendo's first attempt at online gaming, though with the attachable modem being an optional purchase and lacking online games and the infrastructure of something like Xbox Live at the time, the function fell by the wayside. In 2004 it was time to start looking to the past for something new with the Nintendo DS. The dual screen system drew aesthetic parallels to the Game & Watch devices, though this time Nintendo made sure to tell us that touching is good because the bottom screen was touch sensitive. This was the moment touchscreens became a staple aspect of mobile gaming and would go on to revolutionise the mobile phone industry when they also moved to touchscreens later that decade. By the mid 2000s, the next generation of video games were all about two things, high definition graphics and online gaming. Nintendo didn't care about either of those things, instead putting all of their Yoshi eggs into the motion controls basket with the Wii in 2006. While many people may instinctively groan at the thought of the Wii in motion controls, there is absolutely no doubting the magnitude of Nintendo's effect on the games, entertainment and technology industries. The Wii was the best selling console of that generation, obliterating the Xbox 360 and PS3. What also started here was the virtual console service, where Nintendo's historic gaming library would start becoming available for people to revisit or for the new generation of gamers experience for the first time. Nintendo's original mantra from their early days was definitely alive again. Video games are for everyone. 
the movie industry was in for a shakeup in the late 2000s thanks to innovations in 3D screen technologies. Nintendo was on the forefront of those innovations and in 2011 they became one of the first to the market with a consumer grade glasses free 3D device, the Nintendo 3DS. Again, Neo retrofitting their products, 2012 saw the release of the Wii U, the moment Nintendo started blurring the lines between home and handheld consoles. The Wii U derived heavily from both the Nintendo DS and the Wii, a dual screen system that was both touch and motion sensitive. It was here that we also got a glimpse of Nintendo's future with Wii U's ability to play most games off screen and on the gamepad controller instead. Unfortunately, this idea was limited, literally. The gamepad's connection would disconnect after just a few meters or a wall. But now, here we are, the ultimate example of Nintendo's games for everyone, everywhere mantra that's been almost 40 years in the making, the Nintendo Switch. Its legacy of sugar, spice and everything nice finally received its chemical X, time. Time brought with it the innovations of new technologies that Nintendo was able to adapt and create the best parts of its own systems into a truly portable, play anywhere gaming system that also has a place right by your television. And in time, we'll get to see what Nintendo switches to next. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, Amy explores the world of Horizon Zero Dawn, spending quality time with those robot dinosaur machines. And we catch up with Mick Gordon, the composer behind last year's killer Doom soundtrack, among other things. In the meantime, you can catch us at playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Also, if you want to support Player Attack, you can find us on Patreon and help us bring you the latest in gaming news, plus all these wonderful interviews and reviews from the world of video games. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.